Hello and welcome to the Everything Is Black and White podcast. I'm your host, Andrew Musgrove, and it is the day after Newcastle United takeover was completed. The club now owned by Amanda Slavery, the Public Investment Fund, and Ruben Media Sports. I'm joined by the NUST chair, Greg Tomlinson, and Simon Bird of the Daily Mirror. Uh, both gentlemen have been across the coverage yesterday in their own ways. We'll come to you first, Greg. Just sum up yesterday as, you know, chair of the trust, but first of all, a Newcastle United fan. How do you sum it up yesterday? Well, um, amazing to, to finally be rid of Mike Ashley after 14 years. That's my fundamental feeling, actually, amongst anything, is, is that that is over. Our supporters have campaigned to try and achieve that for so long because... He really has run us into the ground with no ambition, no investment, no hope and all that goes with it. So it was just great to finally be be at, at that point, really, and, and to have hope and belief in your football club again. And, and to hear, you know, to hear one of the owners of your football club at the end of the evening talk with ambition and talk with positivity around the football side of things is alien to Newcastle fans over the last 14 years, but not over the, the the time just before that. So to have those those words again, I think it just gives that belief and that hope and to, to everyone on a personal level. I'm absolutely shattered. I'm absolutely drained, if I'm honest. I did BBC Breakfast at 6.20 yesterday morning, live on BBC One. I then went to work until lunchtime and I, I clocked off a, a half day and then every, I think 20 or so media appearances. Just standing up for Newcastle fans when we're being asked questions about why why are Newcastle fans happy today, um, and that, that ended obviously with the news night appearance, um, and then uh, and then finally managed to open a can and relax before some much needed sleep. So it's been a bit of a whirlwind, and yeah, I'm pretty drained if I'm honest and pretty tired. But um, what a day! Understandably, and we'll get on to that issue later in the show. I mean, Simon, for someone who's covered the club for so long. Um, but obviously, you know, you, you live in the city and, you you know, you, you, you're part of it. How are you feeling today? Um, well, it was a great day yesterday. It was really enjoyable. Um, it, it was like a dam had burst. Uh, and it has been a, a miserable time under Mike Ashley. And the celebrations at the ground summed it up. There were some amazing pictures of flares being let off, um, darkness and the Newcastle United um, sign shining, you know, out of the out of St James's Park with the fans around it, and they were really great images to show kind of the potential that the club has got with fans behind it and engaged again and enthusiastic about what the, what's going to happen. Hopefully, um, it was it was a fab day for the fans. We had the absolute privilege of of being at the hotel um, as the final machinations of the deal were being poured over by lawyers and. And then eventually signed at 5.18 p.m. And then we saw Amanda Staveley. She she immediately talked to cameras. What, what an unusual thing that is for a person who leads Newcastle United to do. Uh, and then there were various interviews in, in her hotel suite where we all got a turn to ask our questions and ask difficult questions and also the positive questions about her plans. And you just came away from it at half ten last night, walking away from the hotel, thinking, blimey, we've, we've just had literally... So much access in the hotel corridors, in chatting with over 27 minutes. I had to buy Sports Direct shares and go to an AGM in way down south in the country to see Mike Ashley and to ask him one question, which he stared back at silently for 50 seconds. That is the access we got at Newcastle under Mike Ashley. This lot know they've got to re-engage everyone. And it was it was a, it was great to see what what I mean actually for first hand how they were there, there are people per there. People person, she's a people person, and so was her husband, Medad. And Jamie Rubin, we saw him a couple of times and, and had quick words, and he's a people person. So that was really refreshing to see. Obviously, the, there's going to be a big test now in delivering, sorting the club out, making the right decisions for manager, etc. But it was, a, it was a really refreshing day to think that's ended and there's something new happening, with all, even with all the awkward questions that it's raised. Yeah, I know Lee and Lee Ryder and Mark Douglas were there yesterday. And Mark rang me just after, and he was like a little child at Christmas. He couldn't quite believe it. You can see the interview up on our website. And we've got something special coming at midday as well. So look out for that on the Chronicle Live. UK. Um, you mentioned there the scenes outside the stadium. So I was there from about 11 o'clock till about nine yesterday, and it was absolutely crazy. Um, I just want to play this video so people can get a, a sense of how people were feeling. 
um, throw the date. It's a short one, but I'll just I'll just play it now, and we can have a little look. It's a bit, I'm 65 this weekend, so it's the best retirement present you could ever have. <laughs> So there you saw just some of the scenes and you can go over to my Twitter. I was tweeting the videos out all day. Absolutely brilliant scenes down there. And the, the, the guy at the start, Greg, um, you know, he said he's, it's his birthday this weekend and he's going to retire and it's the best birthday present. And he was welling up at the end. He had a can of beer called High Hopes. That's exactly what he's, what he's had. That was before the deal was announced. But for me, just kind of summed up everyone's feelings. You know, new one has come in, fresh start. They are high hopes for what they, they, they can achieve here at Newcastle United, the potential the club's got. And then just the, the emotion it all means, because, you know, we've seen some coverage today and, you know, there are difficult questions that need to be asked, but it's it's not about the money for Newcastle United fans, is it? It's about that hope, about, you know, going to a game and looking forward to it. Absolutely. It's not purely about the money. Mike Ashley had enough money to make Newcastle into a, if he wanted to, um, and the club with the money it generates in, in, into a, a, you know, ambitious, successful football club. His wealth similar to that of, of, of Leicester's owners. And, and you know, just look at, at how they operate and how they behave and, and their ambition. So you're right. It's about ambition. It's about belief. And hearing, hearing that is, you know, that's exactly what it's all about. It's about people believing again. I think I heard, I don't know, I did, audio coming didn't quite come through there for me, but I think I heard that, I saw your clip earlier and, I think one of the guys said as well. The the first thing they should do is is rename the um, rename nine bar back to Shearers and and you know that you know just for for Newcastle fans, it's just like a sense of belief again and a sense of reconnecting with the football club for the first time, really for for quite a long time. And what a change! I was down at Wolves in the away end on on Saturday and it, it was flat. It it wasn't even angry. It was just flat. Um, and then yeah, a few days later. Everyone is 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 looking forward to the future. It is. It's been a bizarre uh, seven days or so, and it's interesting. Yeah, you mentioned there that there was a few suggestions that you know the rename nine bar Shiraz bar. There's a few suggestions that you get you get the Shiraz statue on a club land. There was loads of what I would say are easy wins in many ways, Simon, for the new owner to do a lick of paint on the stadium. You know the little things that many people feel the club have under Mike Ashley had neglected over the over recent years that would make a big difference just to begin with. Yeah, stacks of stuff like, um, you know, the, the man of Stavely called Alan Shearer, a, a club legend that gets a call off a new owner. That's exactly the kind of thing you need to be doing. And classy clubs in the Premier League look after their former players. And it's really shoddy how Keegan, especially, Terry McDermott um, and Alan Shearer have been treated. And Rob, there's people like Rob Lee who did so much for the club. There's all those people need to be brought back into the fold because they love the club and they've, they've been part of the, a, a successful history of the club. And it's time that the club respected that and looked after it. And I, and I think a hope a department is set up in, in the club to make sure those guys are invited back for match days. They're introduced to crowds and um, that can, they can do functions, they can do sponsorship stuff for the club. They all need to be brought into the fold because a club is all about its history and the memories people have from watching it. And, and the connection they have with all, all those old players through the generations, and that's got to be one of their one of their one of their easy wins, even you know, because I'm sure all those players want the recognition and the adulation in, when they're reaching their fifties and sixties, and they deserve it. Definitely, I, mean, I think what's really interesting though in the, the interview a man I did with Lee and Mark, she she, she mentioned she ran, you know, the text, but they're not going to rush into anything. That whatever position is offered has to be right. So if it is a club ambassador or whatever it is, you know, she says it has to be the right thing. So they're not just saying, we've bought the club, let's get everyone back in. They're, they're, they're still approaching this sensibly like a business where they're not just going to offer someone a role because that's what we all think they should do. And I think that's that's a really good sign of, of you know, what's to come, Greg. Absolutely. I think, you know, she, it wasn't just in this area. She talked about doing a review of all the aspects of the club, 
Newcastle United's structure as a as a business has not been one that's really fit the you know a, a multi million pound business. If you look at what's been there with the management structure with Lee Charnley and you know one one name director, no real executive management, no non executives, you know, no real proper corporate governance, no real structure. They're going to have a lot of work to do to rebuild all of that before they can actually really start pushing on in 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 a lot of areas. Mm-hmm. So yeah, she said all about undertaking those reviews and and then making those decisions and that's really positive i think to be doing it properly i think it has to be it has to be done properly it has to be uh, sustainable and sustained if that makes sense so yeah i'm um, looking forward to, to to what comes but you know right right now number one priority has to be fundamentally to make sure that we stay in the premier league given where we are well that leads us on to the next question doesn't it simon and it is the future of steve bruce she said yesterday on Sky Sports that she hadn't made a decision. You know, she'd spoken to, I think, him and, and Jamal LaSalle's. But, and it appears Steve Bruce is well aware that, you know, he, he could be shown the door, but, it, you know, no decision has been made. Do you feel from what you've, un- what you've heard, who you've spoken to, that he could be out of the door before the Spurs game? Well, if you're relaunching a club and you're going to have an atmosphere that's bouncing in the first game that you're in charge and you're going to be up there in the director's box, I personally don't see how Steve Bruce can be in the dugout for Spurs. Um, it depends how much they look at it and think we they can't get a manager by next week. They, you know, I, don't, I don't think they could do that. I think Steve Bruce would probably have to go before Spurs, unfortunately. It was going to be his thousandth game in charge of, of a club, which was quite a landmark for a veteran boss to get to. But if you're having a fresh start, you have a fresh start. And I, I think Graham Jones could be put in charge for that game. She wasn't biting on it. She was asked several times yesterday. The courts were kind of not, they were definitely not backing Steve Bruce and saying he would be there. And it just depends how, how quick they do it, whether they want a manager in place and a deal done with someone, a replacement before they get rid of him or not. Personally, I think you, you go, with, go with it for a couple of games with, with, with someone else in charge, which is unfortunate for Bruce. You know, he, he's taken a lot on his plate. He's been the only spokesman for the club. He's been, you know, he's he's been he's got a kick in, and many would say rightly so for for leading that squad to nineteenth and, and being so erratic and tactically and not known as best team and all that kind of stuff. He's not the manager to take the club forward. He he knows that he's not stupid. I think in the last during the last lockdown when we were looking at the club, it looked like the club was advanced and it was going to be it was going to be taken over back in whatever summer it was two years ago. Um, I think he expect he was back in Cheshire for lockdown. And I think he expected not to be back then, and I, and I think he, we've had a quote from, from at the time saying I had to get my head around that I was coming back. So I think he expected to be to be gone and not even take charge of the club again then. So yeah, I, early next week, you will have to see what happens Monday, Tuesday time. And I mean, if the new owners had seen any of the video yesterday outside of the grounds you know there were chance for steve bruce to go greg you in the way end at wolves and you know i suspect there were you know that the anti bruce chance were there as well it is very it would be very difficult as simon says to to relaunch this club with steve bruce in charge when there is such a feeling against him and you i mean the, the trust revealed you know that the, the snap poll did which <laughs> ironically it just shows the kind of the, that 24 hours i wrote a piece which said that the kind of the I think it was the, the, the was it the the, uh, the night uh, the dawn's darkest before the night's darkest darkest before the dawn or whatever it is that Batman quote because your results came out I was like where do we go from here and then suddenly here we are forty eight hours later it's been a bizarre few days but it just shows the feeling against Steve Bruce and probably why a replacement has to come in. I think so. You know, obviously we put that our, our, our pulse survey in amongst our, our wider survey results and those results were pretty unequivocal and were picked up and, and, and ran with by and reported very, very well. I think with, with Steve Bruce, I mean, an, an, an ambitious football club in the Premier League now would not appoint Steve, Steve Bruce um, based, based on his, his record, his, based on, you know, what we, what we see in his performances. So, I think I think Simon's right in terms of a fresh start. Um, uh, that is, I think, is what everyone would, would probably want want to see. But you know, he's obviously had a, a difficult. It must be very difficult to, to to work under that ownership. I think you know a lot of people at the at the, at the very start, Alan Shearer and others said to, to him, "Don't take it, don't do it." Um, he decided to do it, um, and you know Newcastle fans, we've had 
one of the biggest, as well as some of the, the football not being being great and, and some some strange decisions. One of the strangest things Newcastle fans have had to get their head around is quite a lot of times um, talking almost like almost talking us down um, for one reason, not actually talking with any degree of ambition when when also saying you're a Newcastle fan, um, and and that's been really disheartening to a lot of Newcastle fans when they had a club with no ambition and then to have the manager effectively repeating the same, I think has, has not helped his case at all. Now I know Newcastle are 19th and obviously haven't won this season and, and the stats are horrendous, but I suppose if Bruce goes, Simon, history might look kindly on him in a way as the man who kind of kept Newcastle in a, in a relatively safe position. And that sounds daft as they are in the relegation zone, but they're only a couple of points out, out of it. But, um, that's how history might look, look upon him. I think more kindly than the current situation looks at him. Um, I think if he goes, I think he will, if he goes, he'll go with a bit of dignity and say, I'll always be a fan, love the club. If I st-, And he said it in, this, in the past, that if, if he's got to step aside and let someone else have a go with a new owner, he'll do that. And, you know, he'll, he's going to get more money than we ever going to earn in the payoff. So <laughs> you can't you can't exactly feel, so- I never feel sorry for football managers when they get sacked because they, they just fill their trousers with, I know, so, um, you can't feel sorry for them, but on a personal level and, and, a, and a human level, you, you kind of do feel for them because it's someone losing a job and they've got ambitions and feelings. And and it's you, you stand on the edge of the pitch at St James's Park and imagine what it must feel like to have half the Gallagher end chanting your name and know they hate you. It takes a it takes some bottle to do that and to play on that pitch as well. So yeah, on a human level, you say oh, okay. I think history will. You know, he did very well. He, he did. That, that was a tough gig succeeding Rafa Benitez when Benitez had gone and no, nobody wanted Benitez to go. Kind of, well, that was a really tough time to come in. And it took a certain type of manager with a human touch with players and stuff to, to steady the ship then. And I think, you know, fair enough, he did that. And lockdown was weird. And he got them through that. And, you know, so, yeah, history looked more kindly on him than, than fans do right now. And they'll say, OK, he was a holding position manager. Yeah. Just looking at the quotes from Amanda Staved's interview with us here at the Chronicle, she says, uh, I want this to be an open dialogue. It's not my club. It's not the PAF's club. We're just here to help build this club. The fans own this club as far as we are concerned. You know, she's very open to doing media. She wants to get the message out there. So from the trust's point of view, Greg, I mean, that must be music to your ears. Oh, it, it really is. Um, yeah, I mean, we want to work with the club. Um, you know, I think you talked before about easy wins. The amount of times we've given the uh, the previous regime very simple, very cheap, easy wins, but they've not even been interested. You know, we want to work collaboratively. I think we put out a document yesterday on what our vision is for for Newcastle United and, and, and operating, you know, with transparency, with integrity, with proper communication and proper engagement and a club representing the city and the, the wider region as well as as just being hopefully competitive on the pitch so yeah no absolutely and you know we we uh through uh, alex um had some conversations with uh, amanda over the last 18 months and you know she gave a a statement to us um saying that you know a strong supporters trust is 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 good for for a good newcastle united and you yeah, know it, it is a really potentially exciting time to work together actually as you know fundamentally the football club needs to almost be completely rebuilt um, you know, obviously we've got the stadium, we've got the that that needs some love. Um, I think more than anything, and and care. But you know, the training ground is outdated, and and the facilities. But you know, just there's so much that needs to be done, and 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 to reconnect, and and it is a fresh start, and just yeah, it's it's an exciting time. It really is. No, oh, most certainly. I enjoyed in a um a video message as well about she mentioned the foundation, how important that is. And obviously that's going to get a lot of backing from the new owners, which is great to see, especially with a new building opening up as well, just across the road from St. James's Park. Simon, do you get a feeling of how quickly things could move in terms of, you know, those improvements maybe at the training ground or at the stadium and and also with uh, maybe appointments? Now we've mentioned potentially a, a new manager, but there's other places that, you know, need appointments and and one suggestion is a, a director of football as well. They well they definitely need a powerful director of football to knit together the kind of three parties that there are in, in terms of ownership. So they need a guy, they need an experienced guy who's done the job before and who has the contacts with the major agents, etc. 
so that's that's kind of a key appointment as well as the manager. Maybe the, I don't know if that could come before the manager. They, they've been working on this so long that they must have they must have a short have had a short list for a couple of years. And even the resurrection of this deal, talking to people last night, you know, it's been on the table for ten days at least, um, probably longer. So the, that they're the key appointments: director of football, manager, um, other rebuilding of stuff outside, you know, inside the club as well. So uh, they've got to get on with it now, but they've got to get the right people. So you know, they can tick along as the club's going at the minute. They've got it. You know, the key thing is getting some wins on the pitch. Uh, I don't think they want to be rushing into stuff too too you know irrationally they want to get the right people in charge which might be a month two months down the line certainly you want something in something in place before december so you can have december looking at what might happen in january and um, where they will probably have to buy a couple at least maybe three <laughs> who knows maybe five <laughs> <laughs> yeah there'll be a list um i mean and in terms of in terms of january we know how important that's going to be but you know, we, we, are we expecting it to be a kind of Manchester City spend or are we expecting it to be slow and gradual and, I suppose, sensible, for want of a better term, as well? I think they'll need a couple just to say we're on the mar- we're in the market here and we're, we're, we're in business. I think January's a bad time to, to buy always. You're, you're probably better off looking, getting survival, seeing who's available, basically. And that it's quite a good time. It's even even better time for them to come in because there's so many players on big contracts not playing at big clubs who could have their careers revived with a new challenge at Newcastle and there are probably bargains to be had so you know prizing players out of clubs now is going to be a lot easier than it was a year ago and Barcelona have got talent on the bench man you have who you know earning 150 200 grand a year a week so it's a good time to be, to be a buyer and I think they can get more value for their money at this point as well so maybe january will be actually a, 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 a okay time to buy and and use the loan system as well so it's yeah it's quite exciting now greg earlier on the show you mentioned that you appeared on on news night last night and you were asked about the human rights issue and it is an issue that has to 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 be addressed we've seen various um you know reports in, in national papers today um kind of some saying this is kind of the the beginning of the end of football and what have you I mean, you know, like I say, it is an issue that needs to be addressed. My take on it is that if the governments aren't going to stand up, if F1 and boxing aren't going to stand up, then why is it Newcastle United's fans, you know, uh, why should they make, make the first move? Why is it up to them to make the stand to address these issues? As sad as that sounds, because it, it should be an issue, but it's it's and it's not to the Premier League. So why is it up to Newcastle United fans to to make the first move, so to speak? Yeah, I think, you know, I did a, a quite a lot of media on this and it came up time and time again yesterday, including on Newsnight on, and on LBC and, and BBC News and a few others. And I think the first thing to say is human rights abuses are abhorrent and um, we don't support them. I don't support them uh, and I never will. And um, but but blaming football supporters for this is the wrong, you're shouting in the wrong direction. I made that quite clear yesterday. You know, football has been going in this direction as a, as a global game where, where clubs are bought and sold by billionaires and sovereign wealth funds for a very long time. And unfortunately, football fans do not have a say in who buys and sells our football club. If we did, we wouldn't have stuck with Mike Ashley for 14 years. But that's what, what we had. So, um, you know, We'll, if we have to, if we if we need to, we'll use our platform to, to raise awareness. Actually, uh, I was on a platform yesterday with the CEO of Amnesty International, and he wasn't blaming football fans. He was talking about the Premier League and the government. But for some reason, obviously, a lot of this has come down on Newcastle supporters who simply have no say in the matter. As I said yesterday, I support Newcastle United because I was born in Newcastle, in Princess Mary's Hospital, less than a mile from the ground. I can't just change. I'm not going to start supporting Sunderland tomorrow because of who has bought my football club. So it is complex. These issues are serious and do need to be taken seriously, but they're not on Newcastle fans to 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 effectively solve them. Um, so to blame football fans is is the wrong direction, basically. Simon, what what, what do you say? I would echo exactly what Greg said. The the um, you know the beheadings in Saudi Arabia, the treatment of women. 
um, people jailed very unfairly because of a certain religious bent or they've protested. That That's all abhorrent and it needs to change. Um, and you're right that Newcastle fans cannot be the only ones to to take these issues on board and and change them. The, the Queen is, you know, we as a country we laid out the red carpet for um, for, for the for the ruler of Saudi Arabia. Literally, you know, we've welcomed him in government. We sell them billions of pounds of worth of arms. Um, we trade with them. They're a key strategic ally in the Gulf um, to keep the region safe. Um, so there are many layers to this story. Um, way above the heads of Newcastle fans who have seen Saudi oil money come into their club. Um, Newcastle fans aren't the ones who can just make can make a stand. They can be well and Newcastle fans are well aware of the arguments because this is all coming out now and Greg's been on news night and it's all and, you know chief sports writers are writing pieces about sports washing and, and all we've been writing this for, for two years. You know, we've literally done columns on it repeatedly on the internet and discussed these issues. It's all been out there. Newcastle fans understand what it's all about. And they can't be blamed for saying, for saying we welcome this money coming in from the public investment fund. And it's it's very it's very easy. It's it's not in Congress to say, but we also don't like what's going on in Saudi Arabia. It's, it's, it, they can they can do both. And what this, the sports washing thing is a it's a strange term because they're meant to be buying. People argue they're buying this club to sports wash the the reputation of Saudi Arabia and what goes on there. But actually, what it's done is shine a massive light on what's going on and create huge debates about what's going on in, in Saudi Arabia. And we're now, there's thousands more people now well aware of what's going wrong in Saudi Arabia because of this, this purchase. Now, maybe football is a catalyst for change. That, that might be naive and optimistic, but maybe they, if they're them coming into this world of football in the real world now, the Western world, they can, things might, might change. It probably won't. But, you know, you can't blame Newcastle fans for welcoming fresh investment in the club. And I think it's a good thing that, sport the the their their involvement in sport and football shines a light on what's going on in their country 100 percent. i mean my yeah. man she she she's she's you know you can say some of the things she said and um, don't really fit in with so she's back the women's team newcastle united women's team saudi saudi discriminate against women that's, that's what the campaigners say she's back the rainbow laces campaign lgbt um whereas you know being homosexual in, in Saudi Arabia is 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 well, I think you can be flogged for it. So, you know, there are, there she is coming up with the right messages about all these issues, but she probably can't change she can't change them in Saudi Arabia either. So, the person running Newcastle now and setting the tone for the club is setting all the right messages. Um, she's not bringing in a Saudi Arabian government regime into Newcastle and wanting to discriminate against anyone. Far from it. She's wanting to support women's team, support LGBT people, be inclusive, be anti-racist. She mentioned all those things yesterday, which which Newcastle fans can, can welcome. She, I mean, she was asked about it um, on, on Sky, I think, and she did respond to it. I'm just trying to, to find the, the quotes now, but it's clear that she's not you know, hiding away from... from um, the no. issue. Uh, I've got the quote here, and she said, uh, "The consortium's lead partner is the PAF." Yeah, uh, where has it gone? No, oh, it's just moved. Yep, yeah, sorry. The consortium's lead partner is PAF. It's an autonomous, commercially driven investment fund. It's a great partner for Newcastle. I'm very honoured to work with them. They've been um, incredibly patient and fabulous partners to PCP. Uh, I do hear the concerns. We want fans to talk to, talk to us. So anybody that has issues, they know we're here and they know they need to come to us. We'll take them through our plan and introduce everyone to the PAF team. So they seem open to um, hopefully discussing any issues anyone does have. Um, in terms of the region, Greg, there's, there's lots of hope that it's not just going to be investment in the football club. It's going to bring money into not just Newcastle, I guess, but you know the wider region as, as a whole, which is great news, especially in the kind of economic climate we find ourselves in coming out of this pandemic. Absolutely. And I think one of the interesting things, obviously, is how the consortium is made up and that the Rubin brothers uh, are also involved with Jamie Rubin taking taking a role there. They obviously own Newcastle Racecourse and they own a lot of uh, strategic land uh, in Newcastle City Centre as well. So, it, you know, um, it, it, it could be um, it could be good for the for the wider city and the wider region in terms of them also making other investments in those areas that is very, very much needed. Yeah. I hope they do. I mean, I, I, I try to find out before this all went through exactly what was planned and 
you know, why why was investment in the city and the region linked to buying a football club? And that kind of puzzled me. Um, mm. There's no evidence of what what why they had to buy the football club to invest in the city. But I'm sure now they're invested in the city and they see the people and they see the potential of the place and how passionate and hardworking Geordies are and how we need jobs up here. I think, you know, I think that's a big selling point when you've got a, a family worth 16 billion quid who own massive chunks of land in the city centre. And also Saudi Arabia, who are who have trying to diversify from the oil industry, maybe into you know renewables and that kind of thing. And we've got a huge thing down the Tyne, and you know councils are trying to you know trying to revive that industry there with renewable energy source and manufacturing. Maybe they can get them. Maybe that's a, you know, a way of getting them engaged in that kind of thing. So there are spin-offs, which hopefully the city council and the development agencies and mayors and that kind of thing can can really tap into to to get jobs jobs here as well and you know make the football club a massive force for good. So Simon, we've we've spoken about how you 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 met Amanda Stavey last night. Just give our viewers and listeners a bit of insight into to what she was like. Well, um, she she's kind of a for, a force of nature, really. She, I mean, she she'd done hours of interviews by the, by this point. By the time she got around to seeing me, um, I was introduced as a skeptic. So, which was fine, and we had a laugh about that. And she read. She said you read everything that you'd written, and I went, "Oh dear, that's that's not good news." Um, but no, she. We we got over that, and she is an extremely charismatic people person, and um, immediately engages with you, and um, is very relaxed talking about her her plans. Um, I, she seemed great uh, later on in the bar. She's a great company. Um, her husband came and, and uh, nabbed her from the three journalists, myself included, who were who were talking to her, saying, "Can I see my wife for ten minutes, please?" Uh, <laughs> I haven't seen her all day, so that was quite that was quite funny. Um, so yeah, she's she's very personable. She will get on with people very easily, and it's quite good. Usually, when you quite a lot of time when you meet people in football and leaders in a position like that, and investors and who are very rich. There's a bit of edge to them and there's a bit of arrogance and there's a bit of you're not sure about them. But she she pro projects a very open um, welcoming image, which is great. I mean, I, I was very I was very impressed. Her husband was also very welcoming. Jamie Rubin was spoke to a couple of times in the corridor just very briefly before it had been signed off. And he was, you know, oh, we're going to get this rolling. We're going to we're going to spark it up, which is great here. And, you know, this you can never tell you can't you, you get your tummy tickled and you get nice quotes as a journalist and you go oh it's all great we look we look you, you can never tell the proofs in the pudding over the next few years but certainly personality wise she was impressive um and if they've got the clout behind them to to deliver then it's it's going to be good you know greg as a as a fan what are you what are you most looking forward to what is the one thing that you just you can't wait to see happen or yeah what are you most looking forward to under this new ownership it's hard to say without sounding like a cliche about just put the hope and the pride and and, and all of that. So it, I can't pinpoint it on one on one individual thing really. It's just about you know having that that belief. You know, my my dad is one of those who um, got rid of his season ticket um, because he was sick of Mike Ashley's football, and um, he texted me last night saying, "I wonder if if we can if we can go again, go to the match with my dad again." Um, that would be nice, you know. They're the types of things. That's what you go. That's what you miss. Um, so yeah, I'm just looking forward to it being, you know, positive, uh, and, and ambitious, and, and hopeful, and, and getting, you know, and just the way everything everything's united and everyone, you know, when when Newcastle United is together with its supporters and the city and the region, it is a force to be reckoned with. We've seen that before, um, and, and I'm looking forward to, to seeing it again. I think going back to what Simon was just saying, if you don't mind, on the last the last question i think it's going to be really interesting in the short term actually jamie rubin is probably going to be really important because he has been on the board at qpr so he's been inside the football club um and i think that in the short term that's going to be absolutely vital and, and, and is a real actually asset to them um in that short term um so yeah really looking forward to, to seeing what happens yeah 100 i'm sure les ferdinand's also told them just how uh, crazy Newcastle night it is and of course like you say his family own a lot of uh, buildings in Newcastle the race course so they're well aware of the, the passion up here but you mentioned there about your dad my dad came and met me uh, last night in Jim's Park just after the announcement and you know we ended up in the strawberry and it was just that moment to celebrate that with my dad was why it matters because every like yourself you know you're in that position where 
you know, it matters to to you why our, our fathers and all that. It's really important, isn't it? It's it's just Newcastle United. Um, just to finish, and Sam, just on the ambition, Amanda Stavely mentions uh, in an interview with Sky Sports that the long term aim is to finish top of the Premier League, but it's going to take a bit of time to get there. But that's you, it. Doesn't feel daft when you hear that because we know that you know they have got back and behind them, but we also know there's a plan there and there's a plan of progression and they want to achieve things. And it's just it's just good to hear that. Yeah, I did write this morning. It's a bit strange looking at the league table currently with no wins and shipping goals. And we're talking talking the next day about winning the title in 10 years. Uh, but why not have that ambition? You know, why, why not go on a journey and strive for that? And, and why not say so? I mean, I'm sure the clubs are laughing at it. I'm sure, people, you know, two sports writers are laughing at it or, you know, rivals are thinking, saying, saying cut, no chance, you know. But you're in football to try and create a mo- moment for your consumers, your customers, your fans, to remember for a lifetime, you talk about your families there and sharing it with them. That's what they're in the business. They're, they're in the dreams business of creating dreams for fans who buy the season tickets and the shirts. And that's what that's that's what Mike actually never did. And that's what a new owners of a football club have got have got to do right at the start. So I don't criticize her for saying for she only answered yes. The question was put to her, do you want to win the Premier League? She said yes. Well, what, she, what, what was going to happen if she said no? I mean, she'd look a right chum. So um, she had to say yes. But, you know, Champions League, trying to win a trophy, I don't know, I'll settle for the EFL Cup. You know, it's, I don't care um, if it's a trophy early on. Um, that, that kind of ambition's there and it's got to be. Uh, so I don't criticise her for making those. She's not making bold predictions. She's just setting a tone to say we're striving again. And that's what people need. Yeah, that we want to be ambitious. And then just finally, Greg, then just your message. If Amanda is watching this, hopefully, hello. Um, what would you like to say to her as part, you know, from, from the trust point of view, what would be your message to hear about this great club and this this great fan base? Uh, welcome to Newcastle United. And we look forward to, to um, working together, fans and owners United, moving forward with an ambitious club. What an exciting prospect that is. Fantastic. Well, gents, thank you for popping on to the Everything is Black and White podcast. To you guys watching and listening, thank you for tuning in. Please remember to like and subscribe and share it with your Newcastle United supporting friends and family.